for those that don't know, uh, what is the specialty of infectious disease? Well, infectious disease, the way that, that we do it is um, when people are admitted to a hospital for whatever reason, they're admitted under different services, as you know, and sometimes they have infections as the reason they come in, but sometimes they come in for some other reason, and I can give some examples, and then an infection becomes an issue in the hospital. So you consult the infectious disease services. So infections obviously are everything from flu uh, to a wound infection after surgery to pneumonia to a gastrointestinal issue. We deal with a lot of abscesses. You'd be amazed at where pus collects in the body and it has to be drained and treated with antibiotics. And we manage a lot of the antibiotic use in the hospital because as many EPAs will know, antibiotic resistance around the world is becoming a huge problem. And we encourage the physicians in the hospital who may be putting their patients on antibiotics to get us involved because we can help select the best antibiotic and the one that will do the least amount of damage as far as promoting resistance. So for the most part, most um, physicians in the hospital are pretty adequate at um, managing infectious disease when it does come out. So um, apart from asking about antibiotics, what other circumstances are they consulting the ID service? You know, I would challenge the premise of the question off the bat because what I'm finding in, is as medicine gets more and more specialized and as resistant organisms take over the normal flora in our body, I think a lot of physicians are not comfortable coming up with an antimicrobial regimen for their patients. As especially physicians, I wouldn't say that's true of general internists, of obviously they they're very comfortable. Uh, but as surgeons, for example, they have a lot to think about as far as just managing the surgical aspects. And then when they find out their patient's knee swab is growing something that usually comes from the colon, you know, it's just easier for them to contact the ID uh, specialists in the hospital and say, what do you think this patient should be on and for how long? And what else do we need to do? So, so that's what we bring to the table. We, duration of antibiotics is an issue. Sometimes people are left on way too long. And then there's the other issue of source control. So if you have an infection of a prosthetic knee, it's not just a matter of leaving that hardware in and putting the patient on Keflex for three weeks. Uh, it may require you to remove the hardware, actually, put in a spacer, leave the patient you know, on antibiotics for three months, and then bring them back to the OR to put it in it. So it's, this is where I think ID and surgery and that example working together can promote better outcomes for patients over the long term. And apart from uh, prosthetic uh, joint infections, um, what are some other conditions that you see come through? Well, obviously, one of the big ones um, in hospital, acquired infections in hospital, has been C. difficile. And that's become sort of a side specialty for me uh, because I actually do the fecal transplants in the hospital for people with refractory C. difficile. So that's been one. Um, uh, as I said, there's a lot of... I'll give you an example. This week we had a patient who had had a benign liver cyst for years that was just found incidentally on a CT scan. And they were just sort of monitoring it every few years with another CT. It wasn't causing him any issues, but all of a sudden it was. Uh, abdominal pain and stuff, and when they redid the CT, it had grown huge. It had practically taken over his liver, and he was febrile. So we, sus we got involved because of the fever, and sure enough, that benign cyst had become infected, and now it was an abscess. So that's the kind of thing, I really enjoy those sorts of cases, because the mystery is, what is the infection? And how did this become infected? Where did the bacteria come from? So we sit around a lot and discuss the pathophysiology of how infections happen. And to me, that's like playing detective again. And I love that aspect of it. And then there's just the regular old, you know, diabetic feet, which can be quite disgusting. Uh, and, and, you know, cellulitis, is this cellulitis or is it just, you know, chronic venous stasis? So all of those things I see and really enjoy. And how would you describe your typical day or week um, in the life of being a PA in ID? Well, I work with three different ID doctors, and so they all rotate one week. So um, 
every three weeks. It's, it's back to the other doctor again. I really enjoy that. Um, so when I get in in the morning, uh, the first thing I'll do is I'll look at uh, the new consult list, as we call it. So has there anybody, has, have any physicians consulted us overnight or early in the morning? And how many new patients are there to see? And I will usually get started with those. And then when I see them, I do all the research, maybe order some extra tests. If they've already been started on antibiotics, I make sure that it's the right one. And I might go see two or three of those and then the physician, depending on how they like to work, we get together and we talk about them. And then we go see all those new patients together once and we put a plan in place. And then we have our follow-up list. So when we see these new patients, it's not just a matter of seeing them the first day and then signing off. Some of them need us to follow along because there might be outstanding tests in microbiology and imaging. So they become my follow-ups as well. And I spend the rest of my day going to see my follow-ups and writing notes. And let's face it, I spend a lot of my day writing, dictating notes. And that's a complaint of a lot of people who work in medicine now. We seem to be quite tethered to our computers and not really spending as much time with patients as we would like. Um, so, you know, my day is about, is usually 8.30 to 5 or, or sometimes a little bit later. Yeah. That's the wonderful thing. Uh, when I first talked to Melissa DeClo about this job, she said I don't work nights and I don't work weekends and I knew that was the job for me. So it's, it's good. Great. And how often do you liaison with your supervising physician? Yeah, we have the kind of relationship where we're in constant uh, contact with each other anyway by text, um, even if it's like, do you want a coffee, and, you know, this morning. So I feel very comfortable uh, changing some patients' antibiotics, but others, I feel like I want to chat with them first, but it isn't even a chat. It's like, can I change that urtapenum to Piptazo? And often the physician is already looking on the computer themselves at the new patients. So we're, we're totally in sync. It isn't the kind of thing, like they've never said to me, Maureen, I don't ever want to see you again, you know, stopping the antibiotics until you talk to me. That's not, it's just kind of evolved gradually as I gain more confidence, then I do more things independently. But I also... Uh, as I gain more confidence, it hasn't stopped me from being able to consult them when I just want that second opinion and that blessing. Um, so I, I actually feel I have as much autonomy as I need. Uh, and, and that's because I have a great relationship with all the doctors that I work with. And that's because the PA who came before me had already laid that groundwork for me. And does it differ a lot between the three docs that you work with? Um, they differ in that... One of them likes to, me to let them know when I've seen a new patient right away because we call those the one-offs. We want it, he, he would rather hear about the new patients as I do them through the day because he has so many other responsibilities in the hospital. Whereas a couple of the other doctors that I work with, they'd rather I see them all in the morning, have lunch, and then let's sit down at one o'clock and let's go over everything all at once. So it's kind of like a, a bolus of patients and follow-ups at one o'clock and then we go around rounding on them all together and then I get back to my desk and I can dictate all my notes. Um, so it's just it's just how they prefer to or organize their day. And it really doesn't have anything to do with them not trusting that I haven't done something right in the morning. You know what I mean? It's, it's physician preference. Fair enough. And um, what's your interaction like with the nurses on the floor or great. other healthcare providers? Absolutely great. And I have to say that because I, um, I'm a consulting service and I don't really have to hang out in a specific ward all the time, I'm all over the hospital from the oncology, respirology ward to the emergency department. But I, we have PAs in our hospital who are in internal medicine are, and basically spend whole days on the wards and those nurses on those wards already are used to the PAs interacting with them and helping them and the the thing about the nurses is I spend more time talking to them about what did the bowel movements look like this morning? Did this patient have a fever this morning? And I don't really have to instruct nurses to do something because it's all done electronically. 
All of our orders are electronic, so if I want a, an antibiotic stopped and another one started, I put that into the system, and the nurses don't care who put it in. It comes up in their system, and they do it. Uh, same PSWs, uh, we have RPNs and RNs. Um, obviously, physio and social work and OT I work, I work with or interact with, but this idea of will they take orders from me has, is not an issue in our hospital because of the electronic record, but also because of the hard work that's already been done to help all of the other allied health understand what PAs do. And um, what can patients expect um, from, your, from their interactions with you on, uh, on the ID service? I mean, I think that they can expect two things. They will see me almost every day and follow me along, but they will also um, have met the physician who supervises me. So that's something we always do on the first day. Uh, the physician will be there to answer their questions. But they know that when they see me after that, if they have a question that I don't have the answer to right off the bat, I'll speak to my physician and get back to them. A lot of times they will ask me questions that have nothing to do with their infection. A lot of times it's, and so do you think they're going to take the gallbladder out during this uh, admission or are they going to make me wait? And I'm like, I have no idea. And no control over that. So a lot of it is just educating the patient about what I, can, what I have control over and what I don't. Um, because remember, we're seeing patients, yes, for their infection, but sometimes that's not all that's going on with them. They have a lot of other reasons to be in hospital. And then one other thing I want to add about me that's maybe different from other PAs is I do, in infectious diseases, you wouldn't think we see a lot of patients in, who are palliative, but sometimes we do see patients in that transition from active treatment to palliation, and they may have an underlying infection going on that has nothing to do with whether or how soon they're going to die, I let them know that I'm okay to talk about their death and their goals of care and things like that. Even though it's not really my bailiwick, if they have questions around that, because I have an interest in palliative care and in dying, I let them know that it's okay to talk to me. And I, you can talk frankly to me about your fears because I've been there myself. And so maybe that's something that I'm adding to my practice that really has nothing to do with my role as an IDPA. What are, what are some of the things that you enjoy about ID and what are the things that you find challenging about it as well? Yeah, I, as I, I, I do enjoy figuring out how this infection came to be for things that aren't obvious. There's epidemiology involved sometimes, so, you know, uh, especially in the hospital when we have an outbreak on a ward trying to track. I don't have that much to do with that sort of thing, but um, my bosses do, so I listen in on that, and that's, that's fun. Um, I obviously enjoy the, the part where we try to choose the best antibiotic with the narrowest spectrum, if, if people know what that means, because otherwise why not just put everybody on ertapenem, right? But there are good reasons not to, and I take cost into consideration. As you know, I'm a, I have a long history of supporting a universal health care system in Canada, and I know that this is in jeopardy, that we're not going to be able to afford it if we keep going at this rate, so I'm a big fan of choosing wisely. Um, so that's what I enjoy. I guess I'd have to say I don't love walking into a room and being overpowered by the smell of diarrhea or a diabetic foot, which can smell like someone's like died in there, um, to be frank. So, you know, those are things, but it, it's okay. There's really almost nothing that grosses me out. I'm trying to think of something that grosses me. No, nothing grosses me out. Uh, so, though, but they're, they're not pleasant, let's put it that way. All right. And um, how do you keep on top of the latest medical knowledge in infectious disease? Twitter. Uh, Twitter is great. Um, so what I do is I follow journals in infectious diseases and I follow uh, smart micro ID people and it, when I wake first thing in the morning before I even get out of bed I'm running through the Twitter feed and if there is an article that I think I need to read I flag it for late for later um, uh, so I, I'd say that's mainly how I stay on top of things but also you know we're we're able to access grand rounds in ID throughout Toronto. So we try to make time in our busy day on Tuesdays to do that, but it's hard. 
Um, yeah, and then just in talking to my physicians about these things all the time.